Hi, my name is Richard Hastings, and um, I want to thank you for taking the time to come to my presentation. I am an MSW candidate at Wichita State University. My presentation today is a shift in mentality, and I will be focusing on the effects of zero tolerance in schools and solutions to help decrease the negative outcomes that come with zero tolerance. So I want to start by defining school to prison pipeline. Um, the school to prison pipeline is a set of policies and procedures that drive our nation's school children into a pathway that begins in schools and ends in the criminal justice system. This was caused in part by zero tolerance policies that in, are in many schools across America. Zero tolerance policies in schools require administrators to hand down specific and consistent punishments for certain behaviors that happen at the school. The consequences given to students are usually harsh involving either suspensions or expulsions, and it can sometimes be for misconducts that are relatively minor. So restorative justice is an alternative solution to zero tolerance that focuses on building communication skills and providing struggling youth with an open space to grow rather than punish. I chose this topic because of my background experience as a corrections officer and then a mental health worker at the juvenile detention facility here in town. I spent a great deal of time with youth that were failed by the school system and gained a large amount of insight on the effects that this has. I then transitioned to McAdams Academy, which is an alternative school that focuses on taking expelled students to ensure that students will continue to gain an education during their expulsion timeframe and help them keep, off, keep them off the streets and out of trouble. So the importance of an education for a student cannot be uh, understated and a social worker is in the unique position to intercept a student who is on the school to prison pathway. Incarceration rates in America are very high. America only makes up 4.4% of the world's population, but houses around 22% of the world's prisoners. When a child is brought into the system, it is extremely, extremely difficult for that child to get out. Students of color, LGBTQ, and students with disabilities are affected by the school to prison pipeline at a significantly higher rate than white students. The three grand challenges that tie into the topic are ensure healthy development for youth, promote smart decarceration, and achieve equal opportunity and justice. Problems that range from anxiety, depression, to alcohol, tobacco, drug use, delinquent and violent behaviors, dropping out of school, and risky sexual activity and unwanted pregnancies contribute to behavioral health problems in young students. The goal of social work should be to prevent as many of these behavioral health problems before they even emerge. By catching these early and addressing them properly, we can lower the number of incarcerations and make an effort to address the inconsistent rate of suspensions and expulsions of white students compared to black, LGBTQ, and uh, students with disabilities. So according to a study conducted in Texas, nearly 10% of students with at least one disciplinary contact dropped out of school compared to just the 2% of students with no disciplinary action. Data from the Education Office for Civil Rights show that black students are suspended and expelled at a rate three times greater than white, their white peers. Similarly, students with disabilities are more than twice as likely to receive out-of-school suspensions and student, than students with no disabilities, and LGBTQ youth are much more likely than their peers to be suspended or expelled. According to the Scott Foundation for Public Education, white male students are more likely than black male students to be placed in gifted or talented programs. Yet black male students are more than twice as likely to be classified as mentally challenged, despite research demonstrating that the percentages of students from all groups are approximately the same at each intellect, intelli intelligence level. Excuse me. A study conducted by Jonathan Brown through uh, Mathematica Policy Research Corporation examined the school functions and academic achievements of 157 youth who had brief contact with State Department of Juvenile Justice and then returned in, to the community. The results showed that more than half of the subjects demonstrated problems in school functions or academic performance after their contact with the juvenile justice system. Specifically, non-Caucasians, those who received special education services, or those who lived in urban areas had lower achievement. Another study conducted by Florida State University used a sample of over 4,000 delinquents released from the Florida Corrections Institute. Of those 4,000, 86% were male, 
57% were non-white and the average release was 6.8 years. So 17, almost 17 years old. Um, propensity score analysis produced two findings. The first was youth with above average academic achievement while incarcerated were significantly more likely to return to school post-release. And the other finding that really stuck out to me was youth with above average attendance at public schools were significantly less likely to be rearrested in the first year post-release period. So empowerment theory works with restorative justice because many of the ideas and steps to solving problems with empowerment theory work hand in hand with restorative justice. The five-step model of empowerment theory starts with identifying the problem, which typically is, called, is the cause of the suspension or expulsion, define strengths, set goals, implement interventions, and evaluate the, su the success on a collaborative level. So restorative justice follows a similar blueprint by gathering the parties involved and examining the different sides. The goal of restorative justice is to find a common ground of understanding and being able to discuss ways to use shared experiences to build a relationship and come up with interventions to ensure that all parties involved can continue on with a healthy relationship. And of course, I would be lying if I said that every intervention works on the first time, but it's the evaluation and collaboration that makes restorative justice so effective. Understanding does not come on the first try, but it's consistency and follow through that creates strong levels of bonding that these, that these kids really need. So empowerment theory leads directly into the pillars of advanced generalist practice. The two that I wanna focus on are empowerment and social justice. The empowerment piece of restorative justice is all about giving these students the opportunity to build communication skills and provide them with the tools to advocate for themselves. Many of the suspensions and expulsions stem from a miscommunication from student with student or student and teacher. As social workers, we can create that open space to, that will lead to communication and healing as opposed to sending the student home with a written note explaining why they were suspended. The suspension is not gonna stop the problem from happening again, but instead just delay it long enough for the student and teacher to get a quick breather. So for the core competencies, all nine core competencies have a space in this presentation, but the ones that I wanna focus on are engage diversity and difference in practice, engage with individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities, and then intervene with individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. A large focus of this presentation has been about changing the mentality of zero tolerance and applying different practice with diverse population. By engaging with individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities, social workers can use client-centered perspective to work towards a common goal. This also means being able to understand personal biases and work to set those aside for the population you are serving. And in order, in order to be able to catch students on the school to prison pathway, the final competency is vital in intervening and enhancing the student's health and education. And then when it comes to social work values, there's not one specific value that jumps out as most important because all six hold an important component to this topic. We are student, serving students who in many cases are a diverse population and through the systems we provide, we work towards social justice and push for the dignity and worth of each individual we work with. Being able to understand the importance of building those communication skills will help bring together students and teachers as well as social workers. And as social workers, we must understand our biases if we are to properly preserve this population. So as I wrap up my presentation, I want to tell you about a child who did not have a father, a mother who left him, and a very difficult time dealing with his anger. School was not important to him at a young age, and he was really struggling. But after some guidance from adult figures in his school, he grew to change the world. This kid was Sir Isaac Newton. His story is a unique story, and I'm not suggesting that every troubled kid is destined to change the world. And I'm also not saying that suspensions and expulsions need to be eliminated because they are necessary. However, we do have an opportunity to help them achieve their fullest potential. The old saying, children are our future, is still around to this day because it still reigns true. Zero tolerance is a short-term solution with long-term consequences. Using restorative justice and teaching students how to communicate and work through problems will not only help to lower suspensions and expulsions, but it also will create a better generation of students with the tools to work through problems and create a better future. 
here's a link to my references. And I really want to thank you for taking the time to watch our presentation. So I'll open up the floor for any questions.